Okay, so now for the main event. Um, our talk this evening is from Matthew, Matthew Varard. He is a stellar seismologist who works at The Ohio State University. Uh, Matthew earned his undergraduate degree at the University of Versailles Saint Quentin and his PhD at Paris Observatory. After that, he spent three years at Porto in Portugal doing research at the Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences. And he has been at OSU since September studying stellar seismology. And if you don't know what that is, that's okay because his talk is going to tell you all about it. Everyone at the end of this talk will know all about what astro seismology is. So please give a warm welcome to my dear friend, Mathieu. Take it away. Thank you very much. So I'm saying all about astro seismology, it's maybe a little too ambitious, but I will try to give uh, some basic principles at least. So I will share my, my screen about that. Um, so if everything is working correctly, okay, do you see it? Well, maybe I will put, uh, is it okay? It looks great. It's perfect. Very good. So I, maybe I can start about it. So just um, uh, in order to give a little introduction to stellar seismology, so stellar seismology is about the study of waves uh, that are going through stars. So it's called really astero seismology, if you want to know. But I think it's maybe a little um, more explicit when I talk about stellar seismology than astero seismology because you have to explain the term first. And so stellar seismology is maybe a little better if you want to know uh, what uh, what we are talking about. So it's called really astero seismology when you're looking at the discipline. And so it's the study of uh, waves that are going through stars. You have a lot of different uh, waves um, if you look at different type of stars. And I will we talk mainly here about uh, the waves that are uh, going through the sun and solar like pulsators, so the uh, stars that oscillate like the sun, and it would be mostly low mass stars. Uh, so first of all, I would do a little um, uh, just introduction about uh, about what is uh, stellar seismology. After I would go a little bit into the history of uh, the discipline because there is some interesting things to to, to show, I think, about that at least. And uh, I will uh, show a, uh, a, a few uh, um, applications we can have today about that. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, let's talk about the basic first. An oscillatory wave. What is it? It's uh, well, you go to the basic definition, it's a propagation of a periodic perturbation which produces a variation of the medium physical properties. So it's, it means, uh, what is important here is the periodic term, because of course you can have a lot of waves that are not periodic. Uh, so a wave is just a propagation of a perturbation uh, that changes a little the physical properties of, uh, of a certain of the medium you are looking at. But here we are interested into something that is periodic, that it's co uh, continuous over time. That's why uh, you are talking about oscillatory wave and not just waves. And uh, a basic description of it would be just if you look at the simple product of a wave, for example, you just put uh, a wave that is attached and you uh, to, a, to a certain point and you move the wave in a certain way. And in that case, you can produce a wave that will uh, go through uh, the wave and that, that will, of course, modify some of the, of the parameters for a certain time. And if you continue to do that in a uh, periodic manner, you will uh, produce an oscillatory wave, of course. And it can be also compared to, for example, if you drop something into the water, you can have also something that is completely still and you drop, drop something, you go drop a perturbation and you can have also some waves that are going through, of course, the medium. Uh, here, you have something that is not uh, uh, staying with time because it's decaying uh, in its amplitude, the phenomenon it is decaying with a uh, uh, with time, uh, just uh, but uh, in, you still have this oscillation that uh, uh, continue to uh, to uh, be there until a certain time uh, because it, the medium just uh, react and uh, go back to its previous state. Unless you are continue, you continue to put something into the water. I don't know why why we, you would do that, but it's a possibility. That's another story. Uh, so. Of course, uh, uh, oscillations are characterized by a certain period of oscillation. So it's a repetition over time, like I said. And one of, um, one of the characteristic um, signature you use when you are talking about that is, of course, frequencies. Uh, so the frequencies of an oscillatory wave is the number of occurrences of, occurrences of a repeating event per unit of time. So it's the inverse of the period. 
and it corresponds here. I have a little uh, graph that uh, you can uh, you can see, for example, where you can see that it's the number of uh, of uh, event of repeating event that you have during one second. So if you have this repetition of annunciation that uh, go back to an original state on only one second, you have something that corresponds to one hertz in frequency. And if you have something that uh, go back to its previous state uh, four times during one second, you have annunciation of four hertz. And uh, yeah. So, uh, for example, uh, the human here can hear um, um, uh, frequencies that go from uh, 40 to uh, 40,000 uh, hertz. So it's very rapid in fact oscillations of, of the medium you are. So here it would be the air particle. And it's uh, that way we can uh, measure, in fact, uh, the properties of uh, the oscillation that we can, uh, we can see. Uh, so, well, uh, a good example is music, of course, when you are looking at uh, oscillations. So one note has a specific frequency. So, you, uh, of course, you put a perturbation on, uh, on the medium you are looking you are, uh, by, by your finger. For example, here, here I, I, I put a guitar because uh, I was playing that instrument a, a long time ago. Uh, so, unfortunately, I will not show you it uh, to you. But, of course, when you do that, you uh, produce a frequency of a certain uh, uh, amount in hertz uh, with some harmonics also because you still have some harmonics of the frequency that correspond to uh, a, uh, to uh, the double time in fact of uh, double period you uh, of of uh, a frequency um, annunciation frequency and you will produce that uh, in order to produce a sound uh, of course and of course when you are doing that you can see that if you choose a different instrument you can have different sounds of course when you have different size you have different sounds uh, so uh, here you have an example with the violin that is different from, um, honestly, I don't know the name of this instrument in English, but, uh, well, I, I know you know it from me. In any case, it's the same shape, but of course it makes different sounds because, uh, so it gives you an uh, in, uh, indication that when you measure, for example, annunciations, you can have an, uh, uh, you can have an input on what is the size of the object you are trying to, to observe. And it's the same for stars. And of course, when you have different shapes, you have different sounds. So you have also an indication on the shape uh, of the object you are looking. And when you have also the, a movement on your object, uh, you will have also some different sounds. So here I had, a f I have a, f uh, a little videos. In fact, I was, uh, I was looking at. Uh, so yeah, it's this one. When you here, it's a, just a little bell that will start uh, you uh, with some movement, and you can see that you, can, you will uh, be able to hear that. Uh, the sound is different when you put it without a movement and when it twice it begins to move a lot that for example here you have a certain sound and when it's, you, you have a movement that is more and more important well you hear something a little bit different so just an illustration that of course you can have some input on uh, uh, what you are uh, what you are hearing also on the movement in fact they have and it could be interesting for stars because of uh, stars are in movement and for example with the rotation so uh, here if you want to compare a little bit stars and instruments for example you need in order to power uh, annunciations you need an energy source so you need for example for a music instrument you need a musician you plug strings you blow into a into a tube or something like that and for stars uh, it would be in fact what we call the convection so it's uh, it's uh, a movement that I will describe just a little later. So it will it, it's a movement in the star that are going through uh, for solar accusators that are moving in fact uh, energy and um, the that is a consequence of uh, the transmission of energy and the movement in uh, in uh, the stellar envelope. I will go back a little back uh, a, a little to that a little after. And uh, of course, you need a medium where the waves propagate. So here, it, it will be the instrument if you are looking at the instrument. For the start, it's the stellar, stellar gas, of course. And you need something that will amplify the signal, so the signal can be heard by a lot of people. And so here, for a music instrument, it will be the soundboard. And the stars, it will be the star itself that will be uh, the product where the, the oscillations, in fact, uh, are propagating. And when you are looking, for example, at the sun, uh, here you have a schematized, in fact, image of the sun. What is going on? What will be produced? What will produce, in fact, uh, the oscillations you can see? It's mostly uh, so. Uh, here, if we are talking about solar uh, pulsators, there is a lot of way to trigger, in fact, pulsations. But I will talk mostly about the case of the sun. But just know there is it's 
all the kind of precision that exists, all the type of stars. And here I will mostly talk about that one. And uh, mostly it will be uh, the convection, the convection that will uh, arise, uh, in fact, in the superior envelope of uh, the star. So the convection, it corresponds more or less to something, if you want to schematize a, a lot, you have something uh, with uh, uh, when you are looking at a specific particle of gas, you have something, for example, a, a particle of gas that is a, a part of, of your star that is a little um, colder uh, than the environment. And uh, that is a, a little uh, hotter, in fact, than the environment. And this particle of gas, since it's a little hotter, in fact, the density will be a little lower and will arise a little bit. And after when it switches a certain, a certain level, after the, it will become a little more, uh, it will become a little uh, more uh, cold than uh, the environment around it. And it will be after the density will rise again and uh, this part will uh, go down back. And it will be what we call in that situation, convective cells. So where uh, you have this movement where some uh, part of your gas will go up and down and up and down in a, in a periodic way. And this will produce mostly the oscillations you can see. So this kind of movement with the convection uh, can uh, can be retrieved here, for example, in the atmosphere of uh, Earth, for example. It can uh, it's something that is present in a lot of places, in a lot of different physical, uh, in a lot of different uh, physi um, How I can uh, what is the exact term about it in English? <laughs> it's um, when you are looking at a physical system. Yes, that's it. So when you are looking at the physical system, uh, it's present in a lot of different physical systems. So here I put an example with the Adler cell, for example, in the Earth's atmosphere with uh, this uh, figure here, where you have also this phenomenon of convection in the Earth's atmosphere where with the exchange of gas in the interior of the atmosphere. And it can be also compared to what happened, in fact, in when you are boiling some water. In fact, it's not exactly the same because the source in, of uh, of heat is a little different. So the problem is uh, still a little different than what was uh, what is the case in fact in uh, the uh, Earth's atmosphere or the the envelope of the stars. But it's um, a good comparison for which you have also uh, the uh, um, bottom of your water that is heating and uh, the uh, uh, the um, the top part of uh, your water that is uh, being uh, that is in con uh, in contact with the most uh, cold uh, environment and in that situation you have that uh, circulation of uh, material that is going through um, and for the sun you can see it quite uh, clearly for example when you observe the granulation when you observe this kind of um, I don't have a video here but there was something that were uh, that were coming out. Uh, during the last few months, where they show a good really video of uh, uh, the surface of the sun and this movement where you have this uh, part of uh, gas that are uh, coming uh, up and after coming down and uh, everything going uh, up and going down again uh, and with this movement that is uh, continuous in, uh, in one sense. So for most of the energy, in fact, uh, where you inject into, uh, into the oscillations for uh, for the solar-like pulsators, for the sun and for other uh, type of stars that have convective envelope, in that situation, it comes from the turbulent convection. It comes from this phenomenon that will uh, lie, uh, that will trigger, in fact, the oscillations, and after the uh, the waves will propagate into the star until a certain point. This kind of waves do, don't reach, in fact, the center of the star because uh, the uh, gradient of uh, temperature is so high that the wave is refracted at one point, but uh, it's, um, it's propag it propagates in mostly in, uh, into 80% um, into, uh, of the star if you look at the radius of the star in itself. So it's uh, quite important. And you have another type of wave that can also uh, propagate inside the star. So you have what we call gravity wave, and these kind of waves correspond more or less to what you see, well, Physically, it's completely equivalent because it corresponds to a part of your star where you don't have convection and so that are regularly stratified. And this medium, in fact, is perturbed by the convection in the outer part of your star. 
and it will uh, since uh, the collection will be uh, hurting in fact i don't know if i'm using the right term but uh, it's uh, um, cheating in fact is the part where there is a regularly stratified region it will produce some waves that we call quality waves and wa that will propagate only in that in that region because they can only propagate in regularly stratified uh, region of the star so you have these two types of waves that will propagate into your star and that we can observe afterwards so what does it look like in fact uh, uh, when you are looking for example of your star at your star when you are looking at the oscillations of your uh, of your object so here you have a little animation that is uh, not really realistic compared to what you see except the light curves is uh, a little like that <laughs> it's uh, when you are looking in fact uh, at your star what you will see is that you will uh, um, you will have some variation some periodic variation of the physical properties of the objects it will be uh, quite uh, it's not important at all the amplitude of the variation is not important at all i will go back to a uh, little to that also later but uh, it's still significant I and mean, in the end you can observe that for example here uh, by observing the variation of the luminosity of the star as a function of time so it's very tiny but you can do it um, and um, you can observe also other parameters like um, if you observe in spectroscopy the variation in uh, velocity of the different uh, uh, um, um, how, what is this um, it's uh, line width if I'm not mistaken uh, and uh, in that situation you can uh, you can see also the variation of velocity uh, and uh, you of the surface of your star and in that situation, you can observe some. Uh, you can you can have some input on the oscillations that are going through your star. And with that, since uh, uh, you can observe in the end for the sun, for example, something like that, with frequencies that are uh, present at some specific point uh, in the oscillation spectrum. So it's not here just by mistake. You have a lot of. Uh, you have a lot of frequencies that different uh, at different uh, at uh, diff uh, with different amplitude, and so it's not here by um, um, just uh, uh, it, it has some physics in it. It's just not here by mistake or by uh, accident. You have something to understand here, and I will go. Uh, I, I will try to uh, give you some uh, key to understand a little bit what we see as of now. Uh, but first, I would like to uh, make you hear, in fact, what you would hear if uh, you uh, you were able, in fact, to uh, uh, to uh, look at the oscillations itself. So I have a few uh, videos here for uh, if you look at the case of the sun. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, no, it's not here. It's this one. So I hope the sun will be well the trans uh, transcript here on the, on the video. Okay, so uh, maybe I can put the video also on Facebook because it's uh, it's also a little explanation of uh, uh, the oscillation. So I hope you heard it a little bit. And uh, what you hear is not very melodious, but it would be the sound of the sun if uh, we would be able, in fact, to to hear it. And af uh, yeah, after that, yeah, you have also a sound you can hear also for other solar activators, and you can see you will see. Uh, that it's a little different following what you what star you are look, you, you are looking at. So here, for example, you have an example with dwarf star. And if you move towards and if you move towards the other type of type of stars, you have a different kind of sound. And of course, it's not so by accident. You have some physics to understand when you are looking at it. Um, yeah. So. Just now, I have maybe uh, a question I can uh, I can ask, and uh, but because here this sound, in fact, we do not hear it, and the question is why. And if you have some answer, I'm happy to uh, to to answer it because I have the answer. But uh, if you if you have some idea, I'm happy to have some interaction <laughs> as of now. I don't know. Maybe there more would be some people putting some commentaries on on Facebook. I will look. Uh, um, if somebody wants to speak, I don't know. Uh, okay, maybe not. 
I don't know if I have to wait a lot of the time or not, but so maybe I will co just continue like that. Uh, I hope uh, I do not uh, <laughs> disturb you too much. Isaac has put a comment in the chat. Oh, so he says that you can't hear it because it's too low frequency. Oh, that's a good point. Yes, it's too. And you have a second reason. <laughs> There's another reason. Yeah. Uh, in fact, if even a uh, well, even if it was at our frequency, we will not hear it. And uh, oh, Don has Don has an idea. You all can you all can unmute to answer <laughs> if you want. Don says no medium to transmit the sound. Exactly. So there is here the two points. It's because of, uh, okay, it's not working anymore. Uh -huh. oh. Yeah. So here's the two points. Of course, there is space. So there is no medium. We are talking about acoustic waves here. So they need a medium to propagate into. So it's not like, uh, for example, when you are looking at the light because it's an electromagnetic uh, wave, and in that situation, you don't need a middle in order to uh, a medium in order to uh, uh, to prop, uh, to make the uh, the wave propagate into. But here, since we are looking at uh, acoustic waves, well, we we need something. And of course, the frequencies are so are too low for human here. So maybe you saw it on uh, the frequencies I was putting. In that situation, of course, uh, it's a little difficult to hear it because the human uh, capacity are between 40, I think, and 40,000 hertz, something like that. And here we are talking about something in milliards. So it's much uh, short. It's much, in fact, a longer period than what we are uh, capable to hear. It's too uh, too long for us. It's uh, an oscillation for the sun around five minutes. So now that you have the basic idea, in fact, I would like to uh, talk about um, a little bit about the history of the discovery of those waves in the sun uh, and other uh, solar light crusaders, because I think it's a little interesting uh, to, to go back into what we knew before. So uh, yeah, you have um, the fact that you have variable star, that, so that star that have some uh, variability, for example, in their parameters, for example, in their luminosity, it was known for a very long time. You have the example of the Mira star Oceti, which was discovered at the end of the 16th century. Uh, so it was known by eye because uh, in that situation, you have variation of, uh, I think, uh, one magnitude. So it's quite big because this kind of star, in fact, oscillate in, uh, on very long period uh, and uh, with the, uh, some amplitude that are very important also because it's super giant at the end of their life. It's, uh, it's quite uh, peculiar in that situation. Uh, so it was known, but uh, not very uh, understood, of course. Uh, it was not really understood. And the first use, in fact, of stellar oscillations, it was done by uh, this woman, so Henrietta Lewitt. Uh, in 1913, it was, uh, she discovered that Cepheid star, so it's another type of oscillations, um, the oops, uh, Cephei stars, uh, deep, the period of the oscillation for those stars depends on the luminosity. So it's possible to measure the, uh, since it depends on the luminosity, if you measure the period of the oscillation, you can have the luminosity of the stars. And so since uh, you know that, you can have also the distance of those stars, because in that situation, if you have the, the luminosity, you just have to look at the apparent magnitude of those stars and to make the difference and to obtain, in fact, the distance. And still used currently as distance indicators, uh, Cepheids, and it's due to pulsations. It's different type of pulsations I was talking about earlier, but still as pulsations, because it's higher mass stars that don't have a convective envelope. But I will not go into the detail here. For the sun, the issue is who discovered the, uh, the solar pulsation. And uh, I was, in fact, working on that when I was writing my PhD in order to, uh, to have a brief historical introduction. And uh, I asked some people that worked on the subject in the 60s, because it was discovered in the 60s, and uh, that was uh, people that were still around that were more than 80 years old, and they told me that they don't know who discovered it exactly. <laughs> well, because in fact there was there were several teams working together, working uh, together, um, and uh, working at the same time, in fact, on this subject, and they didn't know retrospectively who was the first person to discover it. So what what I found. And what you can you, you can check if you want is um, yeah, what is sure is that you have two articles published in 1962. The first one was in March of 1962 by a um, physicist who was named Robert uh, Lighton. I don't know if I pronounce it right or not, honestly. 
Um, uh, so, uh, and um, some, collaborator, uh, some collaborators, uh, so two other guys, I know well. It's a short, um, in fact, it's an article that is not talking only about that. It's a few paragraphs. It's not very detailed, but it's, it's talking about the oscillations and the discovery of it. And you have a second article that is much more complete and only about stellar oscillation, on only about uh, solar oscillations for the, uh, discovered on the sun, and published in September by John Evans and uh, Raymond Michard. And the, what is quite clear from uh, the article they published is that nobody underst underst understood, in fact, what provoked these oscillations. Is that, uh, the article says, OK, we observe that. We don't know what it is. And that's pretty clear, in fact. So it's, uh, it's interesting to know that retrospectively, it was considered as some noise, because they, do not really, they did not really understand what was going on in their observations. And uh, it's, it's interesting because uh, sometimes we talk about signal and noise, and uh, what you consider as a signal and what you consider as noise is sometimes a little subjective because you, you, you want to get rid of, of something, you said it's some noise, but in fact, there is some information in it. It's just you are not interested in uh, the study of, those inf of this information for that particular time. And uh, yeah, that, that's what they were doing. They wanted to observe, in fact, the parameters of the sun very precisely. And uh, this oscillation, this uh, five-minute signal, was a, a five-minute periodic signal, was quite annoying to them. They wanted to get rid of it. They wanted to characterize it to get rid of it at, at that time. And uh, well, it was uh, there was um, in fact a lot of work in order to understand what was going on with those oscillations. And the first complete theoretical description was done by uh, a, na uh, a guy named uh, uh, Roger Ulrich in 1970. With, you have some pioneering works uh, a little before, but you have some, uh, some work like that also. And uh, that uh, proposed really a um, real uh, theoretical description of what we were saying. And it was later confirmed also by other people, by John Lebacher, for example. And uh, the conclusion was, OK, the sun oscillates like a music instrument, and we can characterize that. The oscillation frequencies can give information on the solar interior, and we can really characterize that. So I will not go into the detail of the theory. I will uh, give that a little uh, back. Uh, I will um, uh, give some notions a little later. But um, uh, it was interesting at that time because at that time they had no way, in fact, of uh, knowing what was going on in the inside. Because you can observe the photosphere of the sun, but what is inside, you cannot observe it unless you try to model that. And, um, and uh, the seismology, in fact, is the only way to have some direct in information on what is going on. So that's what was interesting. And yeah, I don't have that. OK. Um, yeah, there should have been something else, but I will just skip it. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's interesting because, for example, what was discovered with that at that time is, uh, for example, the discovery of the internal solar rotation. Um, so the sun, maybe you know, maybe you don't know, but uh, the sun has a differential rotation. So the rotation ve velocity is higher at, at the equator, around 24 days, uh, compared to the poles. And so uh, the question was, OK, uh, we have that in the outside part of the sun, but do we have that in the inside? And the seismology, in fact, gave an answer to that question. So here you have, for example, a graph of uh, what uh, the rotation period was measured through seismology. So uh, in order to um, illustrate a little, a little that, uh, it's like I was showing a little earlier with the bell. Normally, um, I, I was demonstrating that, in fact, with a, a, a bell that, uh, for example, you, you have a sound that is completely different when you're turning the bell compared to when you just not uh, moving the bell and uh, make the bell ring. And in that situation, you can see that you ha can have some input on the rotation. And in fact, the rotation, you have some modes that we split due to the rotation influence. And you can have some inputs on the internal rotation of the sun for towards that uh, kind of, uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, technique. And so they could measure the internal rotation. And what was interesting is that, for example, here you see the rotation, uh, the rotation, uh, um, the, uh, sorry, uh, the differential rotation in the outside part 
on the corrective part of the sun. So here at zero degree, for example, uh, and when you are, it's different than when you are looking at 75 degree. Uh, for if you are looking at the, uh, the inclination at different angle of the sun, but uh, when you are looking at the inside, of course, of the sun, and in that situation, you have the sun that rotates in a solid as a solid body. And that was a discovery because in that situation, people didn't know. They had no way to know if that was possible, uh, if that was the case, or uh, if uh, it was going that way, just by looking at the envelope of the sun, just by looking at the surface, the photosphere. The photosphere. Because, uh, of course, the photosphere, you have the differential rotation, but it's not the case. But apparently, with seismology, you know that it's not the case in the inside. It's still not well understood when you have this kind of difference, but it's interesting to know that with this kind of observation, you can have some uh, inputs on what is going on inside, uh, inside of those objects. So I will um, go back to the history principle. So it was, in fact, difficult. Uh, it was done for the sun, uh, for the oscillation. The measurement of the oscillation was done for the sun, but it was difficult, in fact, to measure solar-like oscillations in other stars. Uh, the problem was, these oscillations were discovered um, late in a late way just because uh, they have really low amplitude. And so you have, and also it's a, uh, quite a long period. So, for example, it was a five minute period. So, in order to have a lot of period of uh, doing uh, on your observation, you have to observe for a long time. And that's a problem because, for example, if you want to observe stars, well, days the day. And that's a problem for astronomers because when there is a day, you cannot observe stars because there is the sun and it's a little complicated to just block the uh, uh, luminosity of the sun at one, uh, at one point. So there was some observation at the beginning of the 2000 of uh, oscillations, solar like oscillations in other stars, but not so much because there was not a lot of mean to do that. You have to observe with during a, a, very long, a very long time in order to have a decent result. And you need to be also be very precise. Um, but there was an event, and this, the solution in order to do that is it was okay, okay, maybe we'll observe in space. But of course, in order to make a mission in space to be funded, you have to have a lot of money. And this money, in fact, will come uh, with an event that was quite, um, uh, that was not related at all to stars. It was, it will be the discovery of the first exoplanet. So it was in 1995, and you certainly know about it because, of course, you have the Nobel Prize that were given in 2019, not uh, so last year, uh, for this dis discovery. And so the discovery of the exoplanet uh, gave a lot of ideas, and the idea was, okay, we can observe the variation in luminosity in space to observe planetary transits, so planets that pass just um, in front of stars. And that situation, uh, since you can uh, do that, you can put a satellite in space in order to observe that in a long, uh, on a long duration in order to observe uh, to observe uh, planets that are orbiting on long period around their, uh, their stars in order to maybe find life. But it, this kind of data can also be used to say, for seismology because, of course, you have to observe for a very long time in space. So if you observe in space, there is no problem of the, uh, of the day. And in that situation, these kind of missions were really uh, wanted by seismology. And in fact, there was some uh, one mission, for example, a European mission that were uh, proposed uh, in the 80s, 90s in Europe, but were rejected because of uh, um, uh, not fully accepted because uh, there were not um, a huge amount of people interested by that kind of, kind of mission. But after the discovery of the first exoplanet, that there was a lot of people that uh, were suddenly interested by that, of course, because you can do uh, something like that. So it's the case, for example, of the satellite that was um, uh, launched in 2006. And in fact, at the beginning, it was done for a um, seismic mission, a uh, uh, stellar physics mission. It was a core was for convection rotation, and that's all. Uh, but when you had that discovery of the first exoplanet, uh, well, people were saying, OK, it's interesting. So we will add something to the scientific, um, to the scientific uh, um, uh, 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 to scientific objectives in that. So it changed to be convection rotation and exoplanetary transit, but, but with the same name. <laughs> uh, so that's a little story. So it was uh, launched in 2006. It observed thousands of, of stars until 2012. And you had, of course, uh, the American mission that followed 
uh, Kepler, the first American satellite that was launched in 2009 and that observed tens of thousands of sta stars until 2013. And oh, you have other recent missions, K2 tests, I will not talk much about that. So, okay, uh, now that uh, I finished more or less a little history about seismology, with that, uh, those missions, we had a lot of um, observations on stars, and it could do, in fact, a lot of science with seismology. I will uh, just give two examples of what we can do, in fact, with that. So the first thing um, is, something that is quite basic but in fact uh, very important sometimes the basic things are quite important because it uh, implies a lot of uh, after a lot of uh, um, um, a lot of help for the difficult things you want to plan so here it's just the mass and radius measurement of your objects and to understand in fact a little bit the mass and radius measurement i will have to go maybe into the detail so when you have an oscillation spectra like that for example, so here it's an association spectra of a wet giant. It's not an association spectra of the sun. But uh, when you have an association spectra, you see that the modes are just uh, excited around a frequency of maximum oscillation, so around a certain frequency uh, after the amplitude just decay. So you have some physics to understand here. And this frequency is called numax, and it corresponds, in fact, to a balance between mode excitation and dumping, mode excitation and dumping of waves that will, of course, depend on the characteristic of your star. So it will be the stellar density, the stellar temperature. Uh, I will talk uh, just that uh, about that on the next slide. I want just to introduce a second parameter that is the uh, large separation. So they are regular, this kind of uh, uh, frequency are regularly spaced to swing frequency following a parameter that we call delta nu, so the large uh, frequency separation. And uh, in that situation, this parameter, in fact, correspond to um, when your wave is going from the surface of your star to uh, the center and going back. And it corresponds, it depends, in fact, of, on the density of the medium they will, it, will, it will go through. And by knowing that, you have here, so the large separation that we depends on the density, in fact, of your medium, so on the mass and radius, and you have the frequency of maximum oscillation that will also depends on uh, on the characteristic, in fact, present in uh, your star. So here it will be a source of surface gravity of your, of your star. I will not go into the detail of this relation because it's quite complicated, in fact. But uh, just to know that it will de depend, of course, on the gravity, the surface gravity of your star and the effective temperature. And when you put these two equations together, what you obtain is that you can obtain the mass and radius of your object. If you know the effective temperature that you can know, of course, for from the observations of the stellar surface. And you can say, okay, it's not very important mass and radius, but in fact, we can observe it with a good precision, 10% for the mass, 20% for the radius. And when I say, okay, it's a good precision, it's uh, uh, here you have the typical values. If you want to go into very good spectra, you can do better than that, of course. Uh, but uh, what is, why is it so important? Be just because when you are looking with uh, classical parameters, for example, with spectroscopy, you can have the surface gravity. So you can deduce, in fact, the mass and radius of your star, but with um, a precision on the mass and radius that is uh, not so good compared to what you have here. And also, uh, you need that precision because, if, for example, you want to uh, understand a little more about uh, galactic archaeology, how uh, the different uh, stars evolve into the galaxy, or how, in, uh, or also if you want to learn more about the planets uh, orbiting around those stars, you need to have very precise parameters for your stars in order to uh, be, in order to understand to know more the planets around it, for example, because uh, when for most of the characteristics of the planets are deduced from the characteristics of your star. For example, when your planet pa um, you are passing by, um, uh, how I can say it, uh, just uh, in front of uh, your star, in that situation, if you know the stellar radius, you can understand what you can know, what is the stellar, um, what is the radius of your planet. But if you don't know with precision the radius of your star, you will have some difficulties to have the radius of uh, your planet with a good precision. And so it's important, in fact, to obtain that for a lot bunch of stars in order to have some inputs on uh, the different parameters you can uh, measure when you are looking at other uh, disciplines, uh, other fields that depends also on that kind of measurements. And, uh, 
And I will give you just a, a second example, um, the evolutionary status determination. And here I will talk a little about wet giants. So wet giant stars are low mass stars most of the time uh, that have exhausted their hydrogen in their core. They are characterized by high luminosity and low temperatures, and they go through many different, different evolutionary stages. And uh, so um, I will go back uh, to those uh, evolutionary stages just a few moments. But what you need to know is that it's difficult to distinguish the evolutionary states with uh, stellar classical, uh, classical stellar parameters because you observe only the surface and you don't know what is going on in the inside of your star. And with seismology, you will have some way. So when you are talking about the wet giant branch, I have to talk maybe a little bit about uh, the evolution of a star. So when a star uh, like the sun, for example, um, have uh, their hydrogen, their core that is exhausted, what happens is that the core uh, will begin to contract again, like it was the case in the uh, in uh, when you have a, a young star that is not yet born. Here, your core contracts in order to continue to produce heat, and with this uh, supplementary heat, uh, the the envelope of your star will uh, will increase, and you have the hydrogen that will continue to burn in a shell around an inert helium core. So you, you continue to have that kind of um, uh, configuration. And when you are continue, when uh, at one point you could, uh, the star continue uh, the evolution, the evolution in that situation, if the temperature, the central temperature begins uh, to have a high enough uh, um, um, level in order to uh, reach helium burning, it will uh, the helium will start to burn from the reaction we know uh, we call the three alpha uh, in order to uh, become carbon in the center of your star. And with this helium core burning, you have also an apparition of a corrective core inside, and it gives some, in fact, some stability to your to your star because this um, energy, in fact, will uh, uh, be able to maintain uh, the, uh, your star as it is, the structure of your star, during um, a few hundred million years. So you have still, with this kind of star, after the helium flash, you still have um, an inert, uh, you have uh, the helium burning in the center, you have an inert uh, helium uh, part around it, and you have still the hydrogen burning in the shell around it. But you have more or less the same structure with the corrective envelope and the radiative part, and you can have also oscillations, like I told you a little bit before, and you have also some input on what uh, are those oscillations and what you can, of course, obtained from the stellar interiors. And with that, you will be uh, able, with the association, you will be able to distinguish, in fact, the different uh, status of, this, uh, the, of your star you are looking at for the, the different evolutionary status. So here, for example, I give you an example with uh, the HR diagram, where you have the effective temperature of your star as a function of uh, the, uh, the uh, surface gravity. So you have here the RGB stars that are climbing, in fact, the RGB branch. Here you have the star that uh, have been beginning, in fact, to climb the RGB after exhausting the, uh, their hydrogen in their core. And they climb here, going through uh, effective temperatures that are less and less important because the star is inflating, and log G also that are less and less important because the stars continue to inflate. And here you have climb stars that uh, here burn quietly their helium in their core, bringing some st stability, and you have really a part of the star, uh, you, a part of the HR, HR diagram where it's really, uh, uh, you have a bunch of stars you can observe, and uh, you can deduce also some properties from it. And here with seismology, you can really distinguish, here it's a, a work I was doing, for example, uh, the RGB from the clump in a very clear way. And it would not be that easy with uh, on this spectroscopy because here you have a confusion that is possible between the two evolutionary states. For example, this uh, wet one would be uh, confused as being blue, so RGB, when in fact it is not. And it's because because of seismology and sound, in fact, the interior of stars, we can have this input. And since clump stars serves, as, for example, as distances and extinction probes, in some cases, it's important, for example, for uh, galactic archaeology, if you want to know a little bit the history of uh, this uh, Milky Way, in order to, it's important to really recognize those stars and to say, okay, I know these ones are here, in order to understand a little more what is going on uh, in uh, the future and in the past of uh, our, uh, our galaxy. So that's something that can be a little useful also in that situation. So here you have two 
possible ap application. There are many of them. I told you a little bit about the rotation a little earlier. I will not detail that anymore, and maybe I will uh, stop and uh, conclude a little bit. I didn't know, uh, honestly, what to write on the conclusion, <laughs> because you have a lot of things to say. To say. But in the end, I just uh, put some points in order to, and after maybe to, in order to maybe start a discussion. I don't know. So stellar seismology uh, is the study of the waves going through stars. It's quite simple. Uh, it's characterizing these waves uh, to allow um, us to know some specificity of stellar internal structure. So I told about the evolutionary states. I could have told about internal rotation uh, a little bit. I told a little bit about that. I told also a little bit about the measurement of. Uh, stellar characteristics, stellar, uh, so stellar parameters like mass and radius. And this technique has been importantly developed during the last 15 years. It's quite recent in one way, because before it was difficult, in fact, to observe that in an easy way. We didn't have so much stars uh, on a, uh, that were observed during uh, a long period, for example, on photometry. It was difficult uh, from the ground. Uh, to do that, and now we have uh, some mean, in fact, uh, some uh, really uh, important uh, way of doing that right now. And of course, it offers precise constraints on stellar parameters that are useful for all the fields, so um, interplanetary research, uh, galactic archaeology, and I can say also that uh, in that situation, I hope it will be developed a little more in the future years, and I know it will because there, there will be some missions in preparation. You have, for example, a European mission in 2026 named Plato that will be launched also. Uh, so it will, complete, it will continue to have an importance uh, to, uh, to the future. And of course, uh, I hope we learn a little more about the physical processes uh, that happens inside of uh, the stars with those, uh, those missions. We already learned a lot, but uh, I hope to continue to do that. Uh, and that's more or less all. So um, thank you for your, your attention. I, I hope I was not too disappointed. That's all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mathieu. That was a great talk. Ah. Um, I have a ton of questions, but if anyone else has any questions, feel free to ask them. Maybe stop. Oh, maybe I should uh, maintain the uh, screen. Uh, you tell me. Okay. Okay. Does anyone want to ask any questions? We can. Isaac has raised his hand. Isaac, go ahead and unmute. Thank you very much, Matthew. Really interesting uh, talk. So a quick question, we talked a little bit about the uh, red giants and basically that implies that there is a correlation between, you know, the the oscillation and the type of star, uh, you know, i.e. like the seismic signature type. So is that what you have found that there are other types of, uh, of stars that, that actually give you a, a seismic signature? Well, you have, um, I don't know exactly um, what, because your question is pretty uh, uh, open in one, in one sense. You have a lot of possible answers. So I don't know if I will answer, if, if it's not what you, what you mean, just tell me, because you have in fact a lot of different pulsators. Here I focused on uh, low mass stars, so stars that have a convective envelope, and that uh, so the pulsation were derived by mostly the uh, turbulent uh, convection in the outer part of uh, your of your star, but you have a lot of different pulsators. For example, I, I told a little bit about cephates, and for cephates, it's a temperature instability that produces, in fact, the oscillations. And uh, you have also a lot of different uh, mechanisms that can produce oscillations. And for massive stars, for example, you have a mechanism that is called the kappa mechanism that is derived, in fact, by the opacity of certain uh, chemical elements. You have a lot of different mechanisms possible. And it, mostly we, most of the stars we can see oscillate, in fact. And the one that we cannot see oscillate, it's because most um, in, a, in a, it's, it's certainly because the oscillations are too low, or if they don't oscillate at all, um, I'm very curious why. <laughs> there is certainly some stars that do not oscillate, but most of them, in fact, uh, we find the oscillation when we look sufficiently uh, with sufficient precision and sufficient time. So uh, I don't know uh, what is exactly, uh, what, what do you, did you mean about that? But yes, you have a lot of different pulsators. You have a lot, a lot of different driving mechanisms. And here I talk only about one type. For the white giants, you have only the solar pulsation. So it, that is that are driven by uh, the convective, uh, the tuber, 
the turbulent convection is the outer part of your of your star, and uh, that is all. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's very nice. I was wondering, Mathieu, with the difference between the clump stars and the RGB stars, what what do the different oscillations look like? Well, it's uh, quite uh, uh, maybe I, I will I can uh, share again my screen. It's quite uh, uh, it's quite similar, in fact, because you have uh, not a lot of difference. Oh, I can't do it. Well, it's not, it's not important, okay? So here, for example, you have an example. Here, if I am not mistaken, you have a clump. Uh, you, you have, I need to get a little bit closer than that. <laughs> okay, I cannot do it. But here, uh, you, the spectra will not change too much. Uh, the global shape of the spectra will uh, not change too much because you are interested in some specific modes. So in fact, what happened is that you have um, as I said, two different types of waves that are propagating into the star for, uh, so, uh, for uh, wet giant stars. So here, as an example in the sun, it's the um, same principle, but uh, what you see in the outside part is a little different because the physics is a little different. But uh, here you have uh, the uh, pressure, uh, the acoustic waves, so the pressure waves, what we call the pressure wave, because the restoring force is a pressure force, uh, that will be excited by uh, the, the turbulent convection in the outer part of your, of your star. And these waves will propagate in the outside mostly of, uh, of your star that you can observe. And in the inside, you have what we call gravity waves um, that will uh, be excited, uh, that uh, where the pressure force, in fact, is a buoyancy force, so it's a little different in that situation. And they can propagate only in the radiative parts of the center of your star. And in wet giant, those different oscillatory waves, in fact, are, uh, have uh, very similar uh, characteristic frequencies. And you can observe a mixing between those two waves. And you observe what uh, you, we call mixing modes on the surface. And uh, with that, you can uh, sound, in fact, the interior, uh, the center of your star that we, we cannot really do with the sun in, in the end. And with that, we can have an input on the size of the radiative uh, part where the gravity waves are propagating. And the size is different from clump to RGB because on clump, you have a convective um, core. And on the RGB, you don't have a convective core. So the size is different. And because the size is different, you can see that in the oscillations. And you can have, in, uh, you can do a distinction, a really uh, clear distinction between the two different uh, kind of stars. You need a lot of precision to do that, but it's completely possible. For example, with Kepler data, it's completely possible. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Oh, okay, so that's why. So does rotational velocity of your star affect your oscillations as well? Uh, the rotation velocity, uh, so the rotation will affect, in fact, uh, the oscillations because uh, the rotation, in fact, will, will uh, add uh, some modes. It, it's uh, left, in fact, the degeneracy of the solution. And you, instead of seeing one mode, for example, you will see a triplet or a doublet, uh, depending of, uh, of uh, uh, how you see your star. For example, if you see your star uh, by the pole, um, rotating by the pole, it's different than if you see your star rotating by uh, the equator. So in that situation, you will see different uh, kind of modes, but we, you will see, in fact, a uh, separation of one mode in uh, two or three, depending on how you see your star, in what direction, in fact, you see your star. So yes, we can uh, measure, in fact, the rotation like that. And you can even, uh, we, um, there was a um, nature paper, if I'm not mistaken, if it was nature or science, I don't, I don't remember very much. But um, you had a paper about even differential rotation, proof of differential rotation measured on another star with that kind of technique on the surface. So it was quite powerful. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, I'm going to hop over to Facebook to see if there are any questions. Does anyone else on Zoom have questions? Feel free to unmute and just ask it. Uh, 
Matteo, are the oscillations harmonic or are they independent of one another? No, uh, um, it's a difficult uh, question to uh, to answer. But uh, um, what what I would say, uh, don't take that for granted because here I don't, uh, I'm not sure to under, to um, to have really um, the good answer to that question. But I what I can see is that uh, no, because it's it's not really uh, when you have harmonics. In fact, it corresponds to um, a pulsation. Um, that is a part uh, that is linked to another pulsation because it's uh, it corresponds, for example, uh, when you have a, an oscillation with a certain period uh, to uh, another situation oscillation, uh, another frequency that will correspond to two periods of these oscillations, for example. And uh, here, uh, what we are looking at is really single frequencies with independent from each other in that situation. So I think uh, your answer is no. <laughs> Okay, I have one more question. Um, Mathieu, what was your most exciting moment doing research? Like, what was the coolest thing you ever figured out and why? <laughs> You're asking that like that, you see. <laughs> yeah, why not? It's difficult to, to answer that kind of question. <laughs> uh, uh, well, it's... It's difficult, but I, I would, maybe if I would uh, think about that, I would have a different answer. But uh, as of now, what comes into my mind is uh, when I was uh, um, in the second year of my PhD, and um, uh, there was a proposition from my uh, uh, PhD advisor saying, "Okay, uh, we should uh, we we wanted to measure, in fact, a certain parameter," and he said, "Okay, uh, in order to automatically measure that, we should do maybe like that." And I, it took me three days to understand what he was doing. <laughs> and then what I understood, it, it was, OK, this is very good. I have to do it. <laughs> and uh, it was very, really very good, in fact. But uh, it took me a lot of time to, to understand, in fact, it, just the concept of what is going on. Yeah. Great. <laughs> uh, when you, I discovered what it was, it was, it was really, really good. I have a question, uh, Miles. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, Lucky. Yeah, th this isn't about your talk directly. But you said you you were at Paris Observatory at one point. Yes. And I was uh, curious if you know what happened to the uh, largest refractor lens in the world that was used in 1900 at the Paris exhibition and disappeared. <laughs> you know, you know anything about that history? I'm afraid not. Because uh, it was at Paris Observatory, but not for very long. Um, no, I'm afraid not. OK. Uh, there, there is a lot of history here, because Paris Observatory is quite old. I think it's it's if it's not the oldest observatory in Europe, it's uh, not far behind, because it was uh, opened in 1672. So it's mm -hmm. quite some time already. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah so. All right, we have a question from someone on Facebook. Uh, it's from Rick Bloom. He's an OSU Program 60 student, and he wants to know what equipment are you using to detect si star seismic waves? Well, I'm uh, currently I'm using mostly uh, so satellite in space because it's the most efficient if you want to observe for a long time. Uh, so uh, the uh, tools uh, I detailed it a little bit. It's Kepler satellite that was launched in 2009. And you have recently the test satellite, also an American satellite that was launched in 2017. And he is currently still uh, taking data because Kepler now is completely done. Uh, he has no um, fuel anymore, so it's not working. It stopped um, in 2018. The first part of the mission stopped in 2013 and the second part in 2018. So it's done. But um, the data are still very good because it's four years of continuous data. And for seismology, it's absolutely great because you have in that situation a precision on the oscillation that you cannot have otherwise. Uh, yeah. So uh, we started, in fact, to um, to have some new data from tests, uh, uh, and uh, we are trying to to uh, to adapt what we were doing for for Kepler to test currently. Okay. Great. Thank you. 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 Thank
So mostly satellite in space, so I'm not using a telescope or something like that as of now. I'm an observer, I, I'm an observer without a, a telescope. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Mathieu. It was a great talk. I learned a lot. Thank you.